thank you very much and welcome our participants i know we have taken a little bit of time before we begin we had some technical hitches but thank you once again for joining uh to take us through we have uh, walter kibet we have uh, steven we also have teresia Mumo. Teresia. yes we have teresia mumo and dr elizabeth who are joining us so very quickly we we shall add the 20 minutes that we have taken uh from the time that we are supposed to begin and thank you once again for your patience and so to begin us off walter kindly introduce yourself to be followed by steven as uh, teresia and dr liz also introduced themselves welcome walter uh thank you ken uh, my name is amra belt africa as a uh, health system I'm one of okay, the training on COVID-19 to all uh, participants who are able to access the webinar. So most welcome and look forward to our interactive session. Thank you very much, Walter. And uh, we are going to discuss about patient screening, contract tracing, and referral at this time of COVID. And we are going to take uh, exactly one and a half hours. So thank you very much. Stephen, kindly introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Monene, working with Amre um, the Africa, in, and um, working within the Department of the Laboratory, supporting in the trainings. Thank you. We'll be talking more on specimen correction. Thank you very much, Stephen. So to begin us off, we'll start uh, straight with Walter. We're going to take us through the presentation and uh, we'll take at most the shortest time possible to present so that we can answer most of the questions that are being projected by our participants. So Walter, kindly take us through the presentation. Okay, sorry, we are losing you, Ken. Yes, um, kindly take us through the presentation, Walter. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Ken. Ken. Hello, yes. Yes, as uh, Teresia and uh, Dr. Liz uh, introduce themselves. Yes, they are joining us in a few minutes. Just begin as they join us. Thank you very much. So participants, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, um, as Ken will be taking us the decisions. We have divided the interfaces going to the community in terms of contact tracing, in terms of ensuring they are referred for testing and also the next steps. And then after that, Stephen will take us through the sample collection and now investigation of clients who are suspected of COVID. So let's start with the investigation at the facility level. Level. So yes, it's good to be aware of. Initially, it used to talk about history of travel to China. Now, every part of the world is almost uh, reporting of COVID. So history of travel can be, and in our particular case, we can say history of travel from hotspots, from counties that have reported in the country. So that is important that this, this travel history changes with time, and they present with respiratory symptoms with accompaniment of fever and shortness of breath and also um, cough. Uh, with that then, contacts would be someone who has probably stayed with this particular client within the last 14 days and prior to that illness onset and a patient with severe respiratory um, illness, as we have mentioned, and they are requiring hospitalization.
So that's who that is a suspect. It's not yet positive, and therefore it's good to be awaiting that PCR. A confirmed case is what we are going to discuss about. Confirmed means a laboratory confirmation of COVID, irrespective of the clinical. People may have COVID, but they are not symptomatic. And so it's good to be careful that this is something that you can also be able to see in our facilities. So let's look at diagnosing a positive case. One is having a positive clinical presentation. Two is having an epidemiological link. And three, taking appropriate samples for testing. And our colleague will later on in the presentation be able to now uh, help us in the diagnosis process. Uh, oral pharyngeal, nasopharyngeal, and also serum samples. In terms of symptoms, we are all aware. The symptoms are varied from high fevers, cough, sore throat, headache, difficulty in breathing, among other uh, symptoms that people could present, including even diarrhea. So, it is good to be high index is important. However, we should not miss treating other conditions that would accompany or mimicking COVID. Now, people would say at facility level, what would you do? Particularly at the facility level, there is rearrangement of procedures that patient used to come in and enter into the Um, the, the entry, the facility to reinvent, we need to engineer, we need to change this approach, reorganize the flow so that you're able to know how to identify uh, suspect cases early enough. That would mean then you are able to, sorry, uh, you are able to now be able to do vital signs, and part of, part of this is a temperature control, uh, which you have to check. Sorry. Thank you, Walter. We know there's a technical hitch. Uh, Teresia has joined us. Okay. Yeah, Teresia, kindly introduce yourself as uh, Walter uh, works back with the logistical challenges. Thank you, Ken. Uh, my name is Teresia Bumo. I serve as a regional manager with Farm Access Foundation. Um, I'm also uh, a nurse by profession. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of Nairobi. I work with Farm Access Foundation in a program called uh, Safe Care. And Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure again for having me. Welcome, Teresia. Walter, you can proceed now. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Welcome, uh, Teresia. Um, so I was talking about screening for a client. So the first thing you need to look at is how do we re-engineer or reorganize the way of actually uh, attending to clients with high index of identification for those with suspected cases and looking at how then do you be able to isolate or take them to a different direction having a dedicated area to attend to these suspected cases. In that context, then the procedure would be taking a temperature. If you look at the picture on the screen, you're able to look at number one, asking the person to push back if they are able to look not you on the face but on the side. Then you're able to now to the infrared. So, all facilities need to have the infrared. We cannot be able to use the contact uh, temperature uh, thermometers, sorry. And that means we have to have the infrared one. So, this is very important. The temperature ranges obviously below 35 then that is not the case. And if it is above 35, uh, uh, if around 38, some people say begin at 37.5. I know many conditions could present with fever. So temperature alone may not be enough. However, it's good to pick this at entry level. Then with that, you can alert a team and then be able to now uh, take the necessary steps to attend to this particular uh, client. So the next thing is having known the temperature, for example, a triage, I mentioned 
recognizing the sort of patients with at respiratory um, infection, and this would include now um, immediate implementation of transmission-based precautions. That means if the client is not having a mask, make sure they have, then the health workers accessing this particular client should be limited, not as many as possible, and then not going to be attended to at the normal outpatient uh, of the other client. So you have a separate one for them. Highly supportive therapy, for example, if they have high fever, you can give an antipyretic. On top of that, again, you're able to now collect specimens if uh, you are in a position as a facility, manage, for example, high fevers. Walter? And then, yes, we can. Um, participants are saying the audio is going on and off. The sound is not very clear from a majority. Okay. Um, can we, Teresia, can you mute yours? Yes, I'm on mute. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I hope we are now clear from, uh, Walter, kindly proceed. Oh, thank you, thank you, Ken. Um, sorry for and that. Take, and take it slowly, take it, okay. take us slowly so that we can hear you. Okay. So I mentioned about highly therapy. If it is IV, you can manage. If it is oxygen support, you can be able to institute that immediately. I know facilities may have oxygen cylinders. They may have also the oxygen saturators. It's important to have this. The next thing is managing shock. Some people in this context may have even hypovolemic shock. That is congestion in the chest. They could be having shock because of septicemia. So be on the lookout for that prevention of complication is important. So it's good to identify and take necessary action immediately. That includes uh, anti-COVID treatment. We know we don't have a specific one, but supportive treatment is required. Specific consideration for special cases, children, pregnant mothers, and elderly could be important. And it's also important to mention that while investigating such clients, it's good to have the clinical scope of a whole client completely. For example, full history, there could be other underlying conditions. For example, a client could present with um, maybe normal infection like malaria. They could present with other conditions like diabetes, hypertension. So it's important to pick them up while addressing the COVID uh, symptoms. In general, there are people who have mentioned supportive therapy for critical Hello, Walter. Hello, Walter. Teresia, can you hear me? Yes, can I can hear you. But I think Walter, you Walter. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I went off. Sorry, I am back. Okay, Walter. Don't scare us. Okay, okay. Okay, proceed, Walter. Okay. So, as I mentioned, that then that, that context, you have to address the sim symptoms that present. However, as we know, that There is here, do you have no the specific present... prevention or treatment? Walter, specific Walter. referral to the facility that is able to support. Are you able to see me? You are breaking. Okay. You are, you are, you are breaking. Sorry. Okay, let's try with Teresia's side. Just project and Teresia to take us through. Okay. Teresia, kindly take us through. Uh, thank you, Ken. I hope we can sort out the water can sort the uh, connectivity. Oh. Okay. Proceed, uh, Teresia. Okay, thank you, Walter. So we are talking of uh, duration of isolation, eh? contact. 
plus uh, uh, with respect to symptoms at the like that. And um, other contacts who are in the, in the community, any other contact maybe in the airlines, in the buses, all those ones are also uh, stamped as contact. And uh, they need to be isolated and determined case by case in consultation with the COVID 19 task force. And some of the factors that need to be considered uh, in uh, in duration of isolation, should be the presence of symptoms related to COVID-19. The symptoms are very clear. This will be a fever, uh, a cough, and uh, other respiratory, upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms. And the date symptoms resolved. Other symptoms would require specific precautions like uh, tuberculosis because they present in the same manner COVID-19. And um, other laboratory information reflecting a clinical status. And uh, we also need to consider alternatives to infection the isolation, such as the possibility of self recovery at home. I think maybe we are not um, at that stage of self recovery at home in COVID 19. So far, we, we don't have uh, all this uh, management. Next slide, Walter. Walter, Walter. Okay, so what are the IPC measures in the COVID-19? We, we had talked in the previous webinars of uh, IPC measures and just uh, to run you through again, this would be the hand hygiene measures. Remember that um, we are following the WHO series of hand hygiene, the hand washing, Use of high of this and lab, wearing of uh, you know, protective equipment, the surgical mask, the gloves, and the gowns. And we have really explained in previous webinars of how these things will be done and off at the same time. Uh, we want to also keep the door closed where the patients are. We need to isolate them and to minimize any movement of the surfaces along any of the corridors. We also need to provide patients with the patient respiratory etiquette uh, posters. And also the measures we need to educate them on what to do. Uh, restrict visitors in our hospital center and even visit visitors to such uh, cases where we are quarantined them. We need to be able to ensure our waste management is as per the standard and as per the protocol. Remember that um, any waste coming from our isolation centers or rooms is highly infectious, so it needs to be treated as such. Cleaning of surfaces using detergents or disinfectants um, also has to be done as per the COVID-19 protocol. Remember that we need to identify the high-touch um, surfaces, the doorknobs, the, the, the tables, anything that we feel is high-touch in our health facilities. And then we come up with protocols of how to clean it. And we are cleaning, cleaning with the disinfectants, and we need to ensure that we have a clean and a schedule that says that these surfaces need to be cleaned regularly. Regularly can be every other patient. After every other patient has been come or opened and closed the door, then somebody needs to come and clean. Then we also need to think of cleaning of utensils with soap and hot water. Those are the IP measures that we are employing now. You know the surfaces we are going to have. Next slide. Next slide, Walter. Walter, are you there? Walter, I, I think today's a bad day for Walter, the network uh, seems to be whatever it is. Walter, are you there? Again, I think Walter has submitted. Eh? Walter, can you hear us? Okay, we seem to have a little bit of sound challenges. Leah, can we get some good uh, sound adjustments? Walter, can you hear? Walter? Yeah, 
Yes, yes, I'm hearing you. You have shared the screen. Are you able to see? Yes, just that it's not uh, moving as uh, I wish that you move. Huh? We seem to have a challenge with uh, the sound and the flow of the slides. The slides are moving. I'm, 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 I'm already on it. Okay. Participants are saying they are not able to follow through the slides and the presenters. And also, their voice is not very clear. Uh, check with the host. Okay. Okay. Teresia, kindly proceed from there as we finalize on the sound system. So what are the procedures for primary screening, risk assessment, and referral of suspect tests uh, for COVID-19? So the first thing that we need to do is to train our health uh, providers. And um, even these webinars are part of the trainings. I know the Ministry of Health has provided a lot of trainings down there to the health care providers. And uh, there are also many other platforms that have come up to train healthcare providers. Uh, so we need the uh, healthcare providers who are the front line to be uh, trained on isolation, precautions like hand hygiene, how to wear and remove PPE and environmental cleaning. We need to educate staff on how COVID-19 is clinically present. And um, almost uh, everybody in the facility needs to be able to know who can be a suspect. And visitors and patients should be educated on hand hygiene and keeping social distance. So we need to start having the posters in our facilities uh, demonstrating on hand hygiene. So every other hand washing area should have a hand washing poster and also directional signs on where patients should be able to stand or sit. Um, we need to provide posters on more information on COVID-19 infection and uh, visitors should be able to be directed well within the facility and give them all this information. For continued of care, a designated team of healthcare workers need to be able to provide the patient care with a complete duty rota for both day and night. So these uh, staff need to be aware of their duties both day and night. Next slide. Teresia, uh, Teresia. Yes, yes. Uh, the participants cannot hear you. They're saying the presentation is very clear, but the, your voice is fading away. So, uh, and now, is it any better? Are you move close to the mic? Com yeah. Is it better now? That one is better. Move. Yes, yes. Increase the voice. Yeah. Then there you are. Tracia, proceed. Okay, proceed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me take you through contact tracing and referral. Let, let, next slide, Walter. So um, remember, we are dealing with an outbreak. So there are steps that um, are involved in investigating the outbreak. And why, why do you want to investigate this outbreak? You want to investigate and uh, give a lot of information. So we know the extent of the outbreak. We know how far this outbreak has gone to. We also want to uh, know the spread of this. Uh, Teresia, Teresia. Yes, yes Walter. Uh, this, yes, Ken. This is Ken. Huh? Yes. Okay. Let's let, let, let's try Walter's voice and see whether yours is fading completely. Okay. okay. Let's try let's try Walter present uh, side. Oh. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, am I audible now? Yes, that, that's audible. Okay. So in terms of investigation, as Teresa has said, we want to look at the extent of outbreak, stop the slowing, uh, and even slow the spread of the outbreak, and minimizing mortality and morbidity. And one important thing we need to look at is how do we participate? Remember, after knowing the suspected case and having a, a contact from the community as we have earlier discussed, it is important that we actually identify them using proper documentation and be able to link to the existing um, COVID response teams in our regions. 
age facility fall in a region with a COVID response team in every county. So you cannot do this as a facility alone. You work closely with the ministry uh, departments that are working in your county where you fall. Um, in terms of finding cases, it is important to provide information on human to human transmission. So who has come to contact with who from the primary index and then now you move to the contacts. Any cases related in terms of time and space for those um, cases or clusters in certain regions, it's important. Uh, clustering of cases is one of the ways of giving out a clue in the possible source of the infection and therefore being able to zero down to really control the spread. How do we find cases? Considering all possible symptoms, matic patients, and also persons, you are looking at cases beginning from an investigation of a particular client, visit a facility or home area where they are adjacent, and also community areas, public information messages to be mounted everywhere and be able to mobilize and sensitize that community. So how do we interview case to patient? So from that, if you're looking at a particular client, who are the initial contacts? So family members, household members, friends. It can also include healthcare providers and lay workers in a workplace, for example, including co-workers, if possible, especially if there is possible occupational uh, exposure. So contacts and identification looks at who has the patient been co in contact with within that duration, so that you're able to now bring them on board. In terms of doing interview, collect as much information as possible. It can be unstructured, but generate a list of all contacts that a particular client has come into contact with. Repeat critical questions, for example, in terms of accuracy, make sure it is valid, able to flow, and then additional details, for example, mobile numbers, names, that can be of importance. Be friendly while collecting this information. Remember, this is a professional duty and we need to really take care of the confidentiality of that particular client without infringing into the private space. However, in public health context and a pandemic like this, we need to really still contain our professional ethic, but continue to get the information as required. So sometimes it may go into a private space, but that is still required because this we must fight together. Explain the purpose of that interview. Why are you asking for these details? Stress on the importance of information we are collecting, how it will help the government, how it will help the community. Remember the first cases who have come out, they really assisted in controlling and even giving information about the spread so that they are able to contain. So giving this information, you are being patriotic to really appreciate that you are doing a job to assist the government. If appropriate, also contact interviews in private space, not necessarily in a public space, because you may ask information that would go into some space that people may not be comfortable. So that is very important, just like we do our clinical work in day to day. Type the information that you are collecting, give the demographic uh, information, for example, the name, age, sex, contact information, including mobile, even alternate mobile contact would be important so that if you are not able to reach by one line, you could get the other. Then clinical information is, are they having symptoms, signs and symptoms, as the physical examination you are looking at, history of the client, vital signs, date of onset of these symptoms, and if hospital admissions as have taken place or not, or it previously been exposed. So exposure history could be also looking at where they have been and whom they have been with in terms of occupation, travel or exposure, even to uh, marketplaces or even facilities that are available. So it's important that we get this detailed information as possible so that case finding can begin. In terms of contact identification, this identification is about diagnosing of persons who may have into close contact, and this could include um, infected individuals who have been exposed to the source of the infection and contaminated food. It can be communal places and also contaminated uh, areas. For example, in rural areas, you are talking of 
water point, you're talking of even animals, if, if that could be of importance. So it is good to get as much detailed information as possible for contact tracing. The purpose is find new cases, meeting new definition, and also providing intervention for exposed, uh, exposed individuals to decrease the risk of illness and interrupt further transmission. There is a possibility because we are suspecting of a severe respiratory infection, it could be severe pneumonia, so antibiotic and treatment could really be done if they have been given. Also precaution information like boiling water and avoiding mosquito bites and like to give a comprehensive information so that we do not leave out any. Now, how to identify contacts again, you're looking at patient reviewing of activities of number of days before the onset of symptoms and based on activities, identify all possible contacts for that particular client, identify individual possible exposures to actually look at the source of infection and verify all information collected as correct. So make sure it is um, verified. Then information comes together more is who or where did each case come into contact close with and what activities were they doing in terms of that particular case when this case came into contact which is possible source of infection. So trying to look for the source is also important. General guidelines do not harm contacts. Communicate precautionally and information should be cautiously given and also um, followed up with. Refer to symptoms individuals to clinic for immediate action and also protection if necessary. Information together includes that I've mentioned in terms of exposure, case definition, high risk, infected, um, and also contacts with case patients. Physical examination information is important. Health status, temperatures, and vital signs. Uh, in terms of monitoring and managing those contacts, um, the government and the ministry has had what we had initially stage one or, or phase one of the condition where they were quarantined. Now we went to what we call isolation for those who are positive. Each region and each county has what we call quarantine sites and as isolation sites. So in terms of monitoring, there is a possibility in the next coming phases that we will have even people being monitored from home. So that vital signs, for example, temperature is taken and reported on a daily basis to the rapid response team to be able to look at what is happening so that they, you are actually encouraging what we call self-health monitoring. Instruct them to report the onset of symptoms when they begin and also visit them when need be to also follow up. But otherwise, phone call monitoring is important. Request for voluntary home quarantine. This is important, especially as we go into the next phases. It could really be huge and may not allow a lot of detail um, monitoring and hospital based because it will overwhelm the system. So self-health um, monitoring is important. Consider appropriate prophylaxis. Um, I want to mention that we are hearing people across uh, chemists and in the country where they are going to buy uh, paracetamol. I'm told they are now out of stock. So those are things that people are already taking precaution, but it is important not to create a lot of panic. This is something that people are already doing. In terms of reporting, what are we saying? We report the information that we have picked to the authorities for communication purposes and for chain of command. Remember, you cannot identify a suspected case and you remain silent. You have a, a root duty to report. Who am I reporting to? The local level, you're looking at community leaders, you're looking at local healthcare office, officials, the district medical officer, specifically the sub-county and county response teams that are already in place, county level coordinators, public administration is important at national level. Now, as they cascade this information up at the national level, we are talking of the Minister of Health headquarters, the response team, trying to put this together. So, in the, and even in that, now from country level, there's also international level of communication. So that's how you are contributing from where you are to the global arena. So that when you look at what you call COVID, Visualizer. If you Google in your internet, just COVID visualizer, you are able to get the whole continent rotating. And when you click into one continent or one country in each of the continents, you could see 
the numbers. Those numbers come from that hierarchy of reporting. Very important to note. And how and when do we report? Use understand standard reporting tools, the MOA tools. These are important. This can be for immediate, for highly infectious cases, and these are for COVID and even other conditions as well. Immediate reporting, to, for example, to ensure that you are looking at immediate reporting would include measles, cholera, eradicating polio, and even the, the other conditions. Very important. The weekly ones, there are those whom you do on a weekly basis for other conditions, for summaries, monthly basis. But for COVID, if you identify, record, and report immediately. And I remember saying, start with the local response team. That will also help in terms of any challenges that you may have as a facility. Going into information flow, highly warning uh, system in terms of fast and impossible means through an email, a phone call, because sometimes transporting a whole physical document could take long. So very important that we can even do that. Some regions could even have contacts. If you cannot be able to get the local um, system and support, you can actually use the National Ministry of Health numbers that are toll free and they are available, you could be assisted quickly. Information should be shared both vertically and horizontally in terms of feedback and ensure that as much as you do through the electronic way, the hard original copies need to be also kept for purposes of continuity because information needs to be verified both ways. Uh, looking at confirmation of cases and filling the case investigation, record all cases and kept in line listing document a form and then also a case investigation form should be completed for a suspect case, community or at facility level and each laboratory specimen collected. Because if your facility is able to do that, that sample should be one accompanied by a case investigation form. So our colleague who will do the next presentation shall tell us about actually now how is samples being collected and transported. So that is an example of the case investigation form. And uh, we are saying fill as much detail as possible because this is not only a requirement in our professional ethic, but also a requirement in national security. Because if we can give information that is half baked, then we are actually not supporting the ministry to fight this war of COVID. So make sure it is as detailed as possible. That those forms can be availed. You can have them printed in your facility so that you are able to fill in the areas that you are able to do to attend to the suspected and confirmed clients as well. Documentation in terms of line listing of all cases, all health workers should capture the details of COVID-19 in the requisite register, the one I've just shared. A line list of all cases suspected, probable, or confirmed must to be prepared and updated daily by the admitting health facility. So if your facility is not admitting, refer. And when you refer, fill the required form, send it to the admitting facility. They are able also to report and update on a daily basis. Copies of each investigation forms and updated line list should be submitted to the next higher level. Remember the way I said how you communicate the next level, very important. The response team in your county is critical to this and it begins from the community level and the area you work. Surveillance team at the county and MOH level will regularly analyze this data, describe characteristics and epidemics and monitor its evolution over time so that we are able to see how we can come up with also interventions that can reduce uh, further spread. A sample of a line list could look like this, where you have a case number one, the date of symptoms, the, uh, is there a cough, is there breathing difficulty, is there a fever? So yeah, you just cycle yes, and if it is no, then you are able to, you just leave Y for yes and an N for no. Then uh, out of that, you're able to say, is this a case who traveled no or yes? That's why in our national um, updates, you hear of uh, local transmission or at, uh, imported cases because that is able to pick from this form. Contacts, are there contacts, yes or no? And you're able to now move forward to identifying the actual in terms of whether the sample test was done and also contacts for that particular client. That also needs to have the demographic, the age, the gender, and even where they stay, if need be. And remember, this is just for 
line listing. You may need to have a space for contact so that you're making sure that you're able to pick uh, these particular cases. And then the case status is to be populated by participants. So if you're able to fill by one contact, then you fill next client like that, then it will be able to fill. So fill as much as you can for each case. And that is a sample of a line list. During the sensitization participants, as we are here, make sure that you populate each case as either suspected, probable, or confirmed. So to not leave out, make sure that each case is confirmed, whether it is a probable case, a suspected case, or a confirmed case. Managing those contacts, it's important that this is a contact that you share. So providing direct care to COVID patients, working with health workers and infected um, who are having infections, visit the patients to staying in the same close environment if it is going home. This is done through the surveillance team and working together with closely with the those who are in close area and also sharing same classroom environment. So those who are in that catchment, you're able to visit and be able to pick all of them. Then traveling together, that's also important. So picking all this and living in the same household, those are the people you pick as contacts and you're able to pick that information. Contact listing and tracing also, when a suspected probable or confirmed case is identified, all individuals that are direct contact with that particular case should be listed using the contact listing form. All listed contacts are followed up on a daily basis, reporting to the surveillance team on a day-to-day -day in terms of last from the last exposure for 14 days, you're talking of whether they develop symptoms or not. And the team should comprise of CHVs, CHU, and also the health worker sometimes, who is able to monitor now and support the CHVs. That is for the public sector. In our private, link to them. They exist in our areas and we're able to be supported. That is also a contact listing for COVID form. You can be able to use it, so feel free. And then um, remember, they should be self-quarantined. So home, uh, isolation, um, quarantining or remaining at home is important on a daily basis monitored. Monitor body temperature for at least on a daily basis for 14 days since the last date of contact. Then symptomatic contact should be evaluated immediately by a clinician or a response team for contact tracing and also being able to test because these are important interventions that we need. Now, any contact having fever as high as 38 degrees and a cough or difficult in breathing must be considered a suspected case and isolation should be done with immediate uh, investigation. I have come to the end of the component of contact tracing in terms of referrals. Now I want to welcome my colleague Stephen to take into the lab component of sample collection and transportation. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Walter. Steve, before you proceed, eh? Yes, Ken. We have several many questions on the question and answer. If we can also respond via the chats, we shall be able to answer very many questions so that we only leave the very technical ones so that we can handle them uh, as panelists. But the others we can answer at the Q&A as we chat with the participants. We are thank currently having you. over 730 participants. So thank you, thank wow. you everyone. Stephen, kindly proceed. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Uh, I'm just going to take you through the correction and uh, sample transportation. This is a very important bit of the COVID-19. So we will be able to see several things in the out train. <coughs> Next slide, please, Walter. Hello, Walter. Walter, take us to the next slide. Yes, um, we want to see how uh, in this presentation, in this presentation, we'll be see the specimen that we correct. And also we'll be able to see the surprise that are required. And we'll also see how we do the sample reboring, transport and storage not forgetting the, a brief uh, video demo on specimen correction, and probably too if time allows, and I believe it will on uh, packaging. But I'll have more discussions as we go on. 
So for the specimen correction, uh, uh, for the specimen which are required, we are basically, uh, or according to our MOH, we are really uh, taking nasopharyngeal swabs and oropharyngeal swabs as uh, Walter has read in the earlier presentation. But uh, let's look at the samples that we can correct for COVID, whether we are testing them now or in the other cases that are going to follow. We can take naso swab, we can take nasopharyngeal, nasopharyngeal wash or aspirate and oropharyngeal, all these are in the, uh, from the upper respiratory tract because this is where we, we are able to gather most of the virus or a high concentration of the virus. Also, we can be able to get uh, samples from the lower respiratory tract, sputum, tracheoaspirate, bronchoalvario, lavage, and pleurofluid. But at the moment, the main samples that are being for the, used for the diagnosis currently is the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal. Uh, we can also take blood. Uh, this is serum or whole blood for PCR and serology. Uh, as you know, now we, we, we could be going to the phase of the serial surveillance, as we described yesterday, and Walter has also alluded earlier today. So serum will really help our eyes on that. The critical thing to note is on our care. So need to use uh, appropriate approved correction methods is very critical. And uh, we had all the samples, we store them, we ship them, following all the protocols that are there. And WHO has well laid protocols on how all this can be done. IPC measures, critical, critical, we should be, be able to maintain them as we undertake uh, sample correction. Um, for the, the next bit is on the samples that we are using for the, the next slide, please. Uh, we want to, before we go to the sample correction, it is important for us to know the appropriate time when we are able to correct the samples. Uh, and that is why we have brought in this uh, a chart for us to be able to understand that uh, in most cases, there is the incubation of the virus before it shorts up. And this takes between day one up to day five. So that is the incubation period. And that's why you are able to see from negative five up to zero, that's uh, the time it is taking that the virus is uh, taking in, uh, in, is in your system. It is uh, multiplying until it gets to a higher level. So at day zero there, at that time from day zero up to day seven, it is actually the most appropriate time for us to take the samples. In normal cases, uh, patients they will be able to show symptoms from day two up to day five, depending with the, with, with the virus that they, uh, with the load they have. So that's the most appropriate time that is important for us to undertake PCR testing. And that antigen, antigen detection again, between that time is very high before the virus starts shedding and then we fail to get a lot of oxygen. Uh, again, for doing culture, that's the most important period between day three up to day six or seven there. For the culture, though at the moment they are not currently being done, but that would be the most appropriate time to get the sample for culture processes. Now, as we go on, the body divides its own immunity. Uh, so the moment now the virus shedding goes down, now the antibody response comes in. So now the antibodies I can now be able to be gotten. So in the first phase, the antigen test really works well. But in the next phase of past 14 days, 15 going up there when the antibodies lies, now we can be able now to undertake the anti antibody testing. But currently, as we'll be able to see, most of the tests that are being undertaken are the antigen test, like the PCR. Uh, we would just want to see in the next slide uh, a bit of now the antigen response, just like what I've explained. Uh, upon exposure, there are the same tones between the two to the 14, depending with the, 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 uh, the, the, the contact, the way we are. So we can be able to see a lot of RNA in the first phase and then the antigens. And that's why I was taking that the best phase when we can be able to undertake the, the, uh, the, the PCR. But as from day 14, as we go on, when the body now has uh, be able to create its own ammunition, the immunity that is, now the IgM and the IgG pulls up. And that is 
the phase in which anti antibody tests can really work best from day 14 going on. We'll be able to see a little bit of uh, that. There are several studies which have been done to try and understand all this and more and more are continuing. Uh, in the next slide, we'll be able to see a little bit of it. <clears throat> so this is more for us to understand on infectivity and uh, RNA detection. And I've put there because that's most, most studies are going on. We've not yet come to finality. And this is just for us to really understand the whole scope. So the virus, it's, uh, the, the RNA, as you could uh, recall from the earlier slide, is detected between day one and day two, before even the onset of symptoms. And it can remain detectable for long. Actually, in some cases, for some of the studies that have done by to and et al and others, it is taken like it can even remain up to day 50. So this is actually an important thing for us, for, other, for, for, for more research to be done because we are getting so many cases of patients who have the, the virus but, uh, or, or who've been detected positive, but still they are not showing any symptoms, that is their symptomatic cases. So we say the viral, uh, the viral RNA peaks for the first five days and it uh, decreases slowly as the antibody levels rises. So RNA clearance, again, is not always correlated with the rising level. So more research on this is really being undertaken to really understand. And as you will be able to see, there was a study which was done and uh, it showed that uh, RNA was detectable between days five and seven, post onset of symptoms. But now this is more, more research on going on this and you'll be able to see toward the very end of the presentation on the, the few tests that are being undertaken for the diagnosis. But let's get back to the, uh, the sample correction. So in the next slide, we are going to see what we require for us now to do, to take this sample. So we need a cryovial, which is now having the transport media. A lot of discussion has come in uh, on what it should contain. Uh, there are some schools of thought which are saying they could have some, uh, uh, it's not supposed to have antibiotic in case you want to do some antibiogram uh, or, or some test on the, on, to check on other bacteria. But uh, I know the, 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 the VTMs which are in the market, they've been put with some uh, antibiotics, a view of it, and also antifungal, so that at least we can be able to get the, <coughs> we can be able to, cap, to capture the virus. We need, uh, there are two types of um, swabs there. We have the Dacron for the oropharyngeal and the rayon tip swabs for the nasopharyngeal. Uh, for the, when you are taking the, the oropharyngeal, there is the tongue depressor, which is important. You can have a head ramp or a, or a, or a flashlight, uh, a permanent marker to give support in laboring because it is important you labor even before you go correcting the sample. This is for the VTM. So pan water or alcohol-based uh, hard gel, this is for uh, disinfection and also to give up because you need to sanitize yourself. Sterile scissors to cut the swab chap. This is in the case where these chaps, they are not breakable, but you could get in the market some breakable ones where you may not need those tarot, uh, scissors. There is the paper towels. We have the specimen uh, rebos, biohazard bags for disposal, critical IPC things, and the bridge and the data correction form as Walter has alluded. Uh, for the PP, which is in the next uh, slide, you'll be able to see the critical PP, which we require gloves, mask for the like N195 and the surgical for the patient. Googles, uh, we also have the protective clothing, very important. Facial tissue for patient use because sometimes the patient could have, be having broke nose or you don't want to get to a patient where they have that bit of it. So it's, you can be able to tell them like to blow their nose before you go correcting the sample. Um, again, a container, this is for giving support in the when we are <clears throat> when we when we are transporting the sample, so the next uh, bit to be able to see a bit of the how now we go to correcting the sample. Maybe you can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you a very short video so that we understand, and then from there we'll we'll come back to the to the discussion so that you can be able to appreciate. How the, the how the 
the samples are corrected. And uh, from it, we'll have a very short, short discussion on, uh, on that. So I'm um, uh, just... Uh, Share your screen. Yes, yes, I'm sharing my screen. This is a video on clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, just a minute, sorry. From Kilipi County. I hope you can see. Yes, we can see. You yeah, can see. Okay. Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. Can you be able to hear? Not yet. Not we yet, can't huh? hear the video. Okay. Add for you. can hear now. Increase, increase. The procedure is also commonly performed to evaluate patients suspected of having other respiratory viral infections or certain bacterial infections. This video describes collection for detection of COVID-19. Here are more specific contraindications for collecting specimens with nasopharyngeal swab. However, clinicians should be cautious if the patient has had recent nasal trauma or surgery, has a history of a markedly deviated nasal septum, chronically blocked nasal passages, or severe coagulopathy. Nasopharyngeal swabs are specifically manufactured to have long, flexible shafts made of plastic or metal and tips made of daphron, rayon, or flocked nylon. It is essential to put on personal protective equipment, or PPE, correctly, and to follow the pertinent respiratory and contact precautions according to both the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and by your institution. If possible, you should put on and take off PPE in the presence of an observer to make sure that there are no breaks in technique that may pose a risk of contamination. First, put on a protective gown and wash your hands with soap and water, or use an alcohol-based solution. And put on a pair of non-sterile gloves, followed by a protective mask with a rating of N95 or higher, as recommended by the CDC. Finally, put on a face shield for eye protection. All sample tubes should be labeled and the appropriate requisition forms filled out before starting the procedure. Masks are recommended for all patients suspected of having COVID-19. Have the patient take off her mask and blow her nose into a tissue to clear excess secretions from the nasal passages. Remove the swab from the packaging. Tilt the patient's head back slightly so that the nasal passages become more accessible. Ask the patient to close her eyes to lessen the mild discomfort of the procedure. Gently insert the swab along the nasal septum just above the floor of the nasal passage to the nasal pharynx until resistance is felt. If you find resistance to the passage of the swab, back off and try reinserting it at a different angle closer to the floor of the nasal canal. Insert the swab into the nostril parallel to the palate. The swab should reach a depth equal to the distance from the nostrils to the outer opening of the ear. The CDC recommends leaving the swab in place for several seconds to absorb secretions and then slowly removing the swab while rotating it. Your institution may also recommend rotating the swab in place several times before removing it. Ask the patient to reapply the mask. Open the collection tube and insert the swab into the tube. Break the swab at the groove. Discard what remains of the swab. Close the labeled collection tube and place it in a biohazard bag. The sample may also be returned to its original packaging for transport, depending on institutional practices. Follow the CDC directions for direct processing of the swab specimen or placement of the swab in media with or without refrigeration. Remove your personal protective equipment, as shown here, or in accordance with the standards at your institution. First, remove your gown and gloves. Then clean your hands with an alcohol-based solution or soap and water. Put on a new pair of gloves and then remove your face shield and dispose of it, or clean and store it in accordance with the guidelines at your institution. Remove your gloves. Rewash your hands and put on another pair of gloves. Then remove your mask and follow your institutional guidelines for disposal or reuse. 
finally remove the last pair of gloves and wash your hands. This video has demonstrated how to collect specimens from the surface of the respiratory mucosa with nasopharyngeal swabs in order to diagnose COVID-19 in adults and in children. As shown, it is important to use approved PPE and the appropriate technique to minimize the possibility of spreading the virus. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was just a short video. And uh, now we'll resume back to our presentation just to have a clear review. So Walter, I don't know whether you can uh, go back to our area slide. No, no, now, now you and you, you stop sharing so that I able to share. Okay, okay. So we are back. We are back, yeah? Thank you. So uh, now we can go back to our presentation and we'll be able to see that uh, after that, um, sorry, I had lost a bit. Sorry. Steve, uh, there? Yes, I'm there. It's only that I've lost, uh, I've lost my screen. Anyway, oh yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm back. Thank you very much. That was a short video just trying to describe the process of sample correction. What is very critical, what we've learned from there is on the, the key thing is on laboring. In our case, we need to give the name of the facility from which the sample is uh, gotten from. Uh, the patient ID, very critical because that's the same information that will transfer uh, cascade all the way until the final because if we really want to survey and get back to understand the how it has uh, to, to see whether the patient is getting well uh, or not that for surveillance purposes per se it is good we have a critical and unique identifier for this patient and then the date the sample has been corrected very important to note that because you could be getting uh, the sample uh, you could be getting another sample from the patient Let's say you've gotten a positive case, you want to monitor and, until the patient gets well. So that is why it is important for us to have the date the sample has been corrected and clearly identified. Um, when uh, this is, the next slide is just showing the basically what you've seen in the video. So maybe Walter, you can see it. Yeah, this is basically what you've seen. What is very critical is on the path of the swab, very critical because if you make a mistake and uh, you don't move perpendicularly to the parrot, then you may end up injuring the brain and there you could end up having uh, uh, the CSF or the, the part from the brain which will be able to leak through to the nose. And in that situation, then you know are, are more challenges will come in. And one thing you need to know is on the depth from which that uh, swabs gets in is actually between five to seven centimeters. So it's not an easy, an easy bit of it, as we'll be able to see in the next slide. Even the way in which we hold the swab is very critical. The way, because uh, some, some of us may hold it uh, from the other way, the, like what is uh, shown in the lower, lower picture there, and then you may remit it to enter until you get to the pharynx region. So it is important that you hold it correctly. Uh, the next uh, slide will just show us briefly on how we, we correct swamps for the oropharyngeal. And uh, that is where the use of the tongue depressor comes into place. And you may tell your patient to say, ah, and then with that, you'll be able now to get the sample. In these situations, uh, it is always advisable. You know, some of us could be at the effect of maybe uh, you could be cheeky or uh, maybe you've taken one for the load for lack of better word. And uh, this then becomes very critical because you may end up now touching the tongue and all that. And then you end up uh, not getting the light full sample. So it is important that you be firm enough and you hold the patient 
firm enough so that you are able to get the, the sample. Uh, now from there, after we are able to get the sample, now it is in, there are several things for us to, to know that uh, the PPE, the way in which you are getting for, for the, like for the upper respiratory tract infection, uh, you need to be cautious because there could be droplets and issues of contact as you, they have been alluded. And for the lower respiratory tract specimen, the issues of airborne precautions, very critical. So we need to have like the mask all through. Uh, it is important in, in severe cases of upper respir respiratory tract samples, they may not be adequate. This is in severe cases, sorry. So, and then that is where the lower uh, respiratory tract infection specimen can come into force. Like the cases of patients who are not able to hold themselves or you are having some challenges of getting the sample. Now, uh, there has been a lot of discussions on uh, the due infection with other respiratory tract, if, like, respiratory uh, viral infections, which have been found with COVID-19. So a lot more studies are being done to look into this. Uh, in hospitalized uh, patients, it is good to, the way the samples are going to be corrected will depend with the local circumstances. And it is important that, uh, again, you try and correct the samples early enough so that we're able to capture the, the viral RNA between two to four days. And then, you know, the consecutive, until you get two consecutive negative samples, this is probably from the day 10 to 14 there. Uh, there has been a lot of discussions on uh, the blood cultures, and that is why there was a dis there's more discussions on the failure to put antibiotics and putting antibiotics in the VTM India. So the critical beta's do not uh, delay the antibiotic therapy uh, when you are correcting also the blood cultures. <clears throat> we get to the next slide you'll be able to see on the ways in which we store the samples. In most of these samples, they should be transported within 72 hours. That is at four degrees to the testing laboratory. But just in case you have a challenge of uh, not being to transport that sample within that period, you can store it at a negative 70 degrees and then you ship it on dry ice. Here, we should take in, in uh, we should take in uh, care and avoid repeated freeze and thawing because uh, at the end of the day, we are going to affect the virus. So the use of the frost-free freezers is uh, really discouraged. Uh, for the serum, which uh, as we go on with the, the, the surveillance, the, we, we are going to the serum surveillance prevalence uh, studies, it is important that uh, they are also transported at four degrees uh, and they are stable for up to one week. And in, in this case, for, specimens, uh, for the serums, you can uh, put them in multiple array codes. <clears throat> now we we'll go now to the next phase. And this next phase is on the, the way now we package our samples. Very, very, very important because you know we, we are dealing with an infectious virus. So triple packaging comes into play. There are several things that you need to put to know that in triple packaging, you, the sample is put in the first primary container. This could be, for example, the VTM uh, tube with which it is. And then after that, you put an absorbent material around that tube, just in case there is a problem and uh, the, the cap, which, which in most cases should be screw capped, locks out then the absorbent material should be able now to absorb all that sample. Now, uh, from that, now we have the secondary container. This secondary container, again, should be rigid, and it should be able to withstand some pressure, about 95 kPa. And uh, from after you put now the first, uh, uh, the sample with its absorbent material in the, second, in the secondary container, then you are supposed to be, you are supposed to cover it and you cap it uh, completely well. Then you put it into the third container, which is now the outer tertiary container. And uh, before, in between the secondary container and the tertiary container, that is where now you have a section to put your specimen records. So, and these specimen records you can, in most cases it is important, you can have like a ziplock bag, you put them there, 
and then <clears throat> you are able now to put everything now into the tertiary container. Now, in some situations, you can get uh, some ready-made uh, triple packaging uh, container which have a slot for you to put the specimen record. That's advisable. On the light, uh, uh, on the outer package, now that is where you should be able to put a biohazard label like the UN 373 label and the classification. And then you also put your, the address where the samples are going, very important. And then from there now the samples, you can be able now to set them out. So what is very critical is for us to know how to package the samples and you package them well, taking care that you don't contaminate, very critical. Uh, we'll uh, be able to see in the next uh, just a, a small information on how the samples should be able to be uh, packaged. But for us to transport as 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 a valued, it is important for us to follow the guidelines. We we have the WHO guidelines for uh, specimen uh, uh, transport, and also they are also need to follow the IATA in situations whereby. Uh, Samples could be transported outside where you could require some uh, transportation outside. And uh, there is also very important thing is to coordinate with the laboratory, the receiving laboratory, because it is important you call them early enough, even before you set out. <clears throat> yeah, you, even if, if you are able to, it is, imp sorry, it is important you coordinate with the laboratory. Tell them that you are able to send a sample at this time and you keep time because they will be waiting for it. And you, you know in these situations we are time is of essence. So we are just going to the next bit just to see some graphical representation of the of this packaging of the specimens. Maybe Walter. Yeah. This is just a brief uh, of what we've discussed. Laboring of the specimen, very critical transportation. We've talked about that you maintain the appropriate temperature. You minimize transport time, avoid recaging, very important. And then all the line list uh, and all the other documents which are very critical, it is important that uh, you have them and you include them in the transportation. Uh, maybe you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Yeah, let's, let's go to the next. We'll be able now to have that more discussion on the next slide. Yes, so this is basically like uh, uh, what the video could have shown, but it is more on what we require. And it, <coughs> the, the, the earlier slide was just showing this. We have the specimen containers. We have the secondary sample containers. We have an absorbent material. And we have our cool box, like in our situation, and the ice packs for situations where you, because you need to maintain that temperature at negative at four degrees <clears throat> the next slide is also showing us just basically all that process the sample you load it in an absorbent material then you put it in the secondary container after that now you are putting it also you could, could have a bubble lab in it and after that that is where you'll be able now to put your specimen uh your your records go to the next uh, next slide you're able to see how you are going to put your records then after that you put it in the container and uh, you are able to close and uh, you, it, it is ready for you to be to to send it out what is very critical there is that uh, you decontaminate the area completely well uh briefly i'm going to tell you about the several laboratory tests which have been there, but what is critical is that uh, the criteria for testing, currently we are using the molecular test. However, depending with the intensity of transmission or the number of cases and laboratory capacity, uh, there is other testing processes which are coming in. But uh, during community transmission, WHO is also recommending prioritizing persons to be tested. This is as per the global testing strategy of COVID. Uh, and uh, I would uh, urge all of us, when we have that in, uh, time, we go to the, web, to the WHO website and we are going to get all that information. Now, we have several tests. Other than the PCR, which we've talked about earlier enough, 
there are other now uh, which is are currently being used there has been a lot of discussions on the use of the uh, immunological tests which are like point, point of care and uh, this is like the other serological test and uh, WHO has really looked into all this information. There was a scientific brief which was uh, giving, given out on 8th April. So I would urge all of us to take time and go through it. It's a long one, but uh, what is there is that uh, it is giving us more information on the, the usage of the point of care diagnostics test. And uh, as we'll be able to see that currently, as we are, it is, PCR, which is being used, but there, are, there is a lot of discussions on the use of, of point of care, uh, uh, point of care test. So you'll be able to see in the next bit a lot of discussion which is happening. Maybe Walter, we can go to the next slide. There has been a lot of discussions on uh, the usage of the diagnostic test uh, because we are looking at their target, their accuracy, their accessibility and affordability, and the time frame. So you'll be able to see Morecura is the one which is really taken into play because of the sensitivity and specificity. It's quite higher compared to the other one. But when it comes now to accessibility, that is where the challenge is and the affordability. But look at the duration, the time. It's between zero to seven days. When you go to the antigen test, which we are looking at the proteins, and, uh, you can look and you, you'll be able, you can be able to see the sensitivity and specificity. But when you come to the serology, where we are looking at the target with the antibody, yes, they are sensitive, but uh, specificity could uh, retrobate be lower than uh, the molecular test, but the accessibility is there and the cost is lower. But the duration again is wide, between seven to 40 days up to 50. So there is a lot of discussions there. And uh, you'll be able to see in the next uh, slide we are on the issue of the, the serology testing. The, this is, yeah, they are there, the possible use of the, the lapid test. Well, they can be used in the lapid uh, triaging as uh, Walter has really talked about, more on triaging. I may not really go there, to talk more about there, but it just, it's just because we are getting so many cases of uh, asymptomatic. So uh, it would really help in triaging, it would really help in relieving the backlog and the wake waiting time for molecular testing because we, we know it's taking a bit of time before we get all this testing, molecular testing done. Uh, for the testing of contacts of confirmed cases, very important there because again, we are getting so many large numbers of infected individuals who are only showing uh, mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. And uh, they can still check the virus and trans transmit infections. So this one can help uh, in uh, Inter interrupting that chain of transmission in the community. So that is where testing of contacts is important. Uh, situation analysis and surveillance, very critical. The, the, the lapid tests, once they, they, they roll in the market, they will really help in this because um, they will help in the syndromic uh, surveillance programs, very critical. And uh, as you know, that uh, serology test just across the other testing uh, programs, they, they would help in the estimating the true, ca true extent of the pandemic. Uh, they would also give support uh, in us to understand the geographic distribution and also be able, we, we can be able now to identify the hotspot. They can also help us to determine the attack rate, you know, and the risk uh, population. This is very critical for surveillance. And again, monitoring the trends over time. And therefore, these results can be used to inform on the, the public health measures that needs to be undertaken. However, there has been a lot of discussions on the, can you use the serology test to discharge? And uh, WHO is actually not recommending their use to discharge the, the COVID-19 uh, patients, as we've seen. There is also issue of immunity passports, and this has uh, really been discussed across. And uh, we are saying, we are not, at the moment, it is not sure, like in other viruses where there is herd immunity. At the moment, it's not uh, really, has, has not been determined for this COVID. So it's not recommended for immunity passports. And I think uh, we'll, we are coming to the end of uh, my presentation. So in this, this is just uh, requesting for more information and further research. You can get more information from WHO, from Ministry of Health websites, 
and I would encourage everybody to read through to get, get more information on the COVID-19 disease. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Steve. Uh, Ken? Thank you very much, Steve, uh, for that elaborate uh, presentation. Now, before we begin taking the questions from the participants, uh, let me just put one point across that uh, for all the PowerPoints that we are sharing today, you can get them through www.khf.co.ke. khf.co.ke. So once you go to that website, you will get all the presentations. And also to mention before we start getting the questions, we have these sessions every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So always uh, log in every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday so that we can learn more. And there are very many questions that have been uh, shared. So I will mention a few. Dr. Elizabeth, have you joined us already? Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Ari. So that was a very good presentation from the panelists. Um, Teresia, you're still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, there are some 10 questions that I want us to look at very briefly so that uh, we can pick more questions. We have over 55 questions here. Uh, the very first question that uh, has been asked, why are we only taking uh, temperature measurements and we are not doing all other, we are not taking other symptoms or even asking the history from um, the population. Why is it only the temperature at the entry points of gates or roads or roadblocks? And then number two. Okay, okay. Let's proceed. Let's proceed. And then number two, how can we educate the public on waste disposal, especially the masks? Yes. And again, on the masks, how, ca how can we dispose N95 and after how long? And then what is the shelf life of COVID-19 virus without the host? So let's look at those three and then we proceed to the others. Only temperature, uh, educate the, ma the public on the masks and how soon can we uh, dispose the N95 considering the pricing as well and uh, how long can the virus stay without the host? Yes. A quick one on the on the temperature. Uh, I want to say that um, temperature is just one of the simple ways of picking up any abnormality. However, facilities can actually do as many uh, uh, controls as possible. But in a facility, for example, I've worked to several and I find the temperature is being done at the gate by the security. And, and, and so the message is, when it is high temperature, what happens? So each facility has a method they can devise, they can reorganize, but just to start off, you cannot maybe, for example, take history at the gate because the gate man, the watchman and the security cannot do that. So we are saying, as we, what we call support each other, we can reinvent and look at the ways of just minimizing a suspected client mixing with other clients in the reception so that you realize when it is too late. So using the temperature as a method of identifying would be one, but the facility, if you have the ability and the resources, you can have even uh, many other things being done, not necessarily the temperature. So the temperature is just an entry point. It's an example of how you can uh, try to identify the cases highly enough and then institute the necessary uh, prevention. Now, Walter, uh, on the same, let me just add one more question on the same so that we don't repeat it. If yes. a patient has a history of chronic upper respiratory tract infection and has malaria for which presents high fever, is this patient liable for quarantine? Now, um, Ken, um, quarantine, as I mentioned, is about exposure, if there is an exposed case. In an hospital setting, if you're able to identify that this is a chronic chest infection, bronchitis and alike, that is okay. But if malaria is there, that's why I'm saying holistically identify the many things that would be going on in the patient's body. So that out of that, then you're able to segregate that it is not COVID. So let us not um, 
say any viva alone with a chronic chest infection, quickly you are suspecting yes, but rule out and make sure that you're able not to uh, stigmatize the client and go into a, the wrong issue, for example. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of shelf Number life, of the oh, sorry. Let me, let me just add something. Eh? Hello? Yes, there is here. Kindly okay, proceed. Let me, add, let me just add something about uh, the, you know, the changes at um, the gate. Eh? Um, in the health facilities, I expect the facilities will set up a screening desk. A screening desk with the um, uh, with a healthcare professional, somebody who has been put to an oral hospital, uh, and even to ask more questions about whether the patient has a, a cough, has been having a fever, has been having a, any complications with their infections and all that. The facilities to start uh, creating a screening tool that will have all that test information. So the setting of the temperature at the gate in the healthcare facilities for me. Um, let, let, let's leave that one to the other In the healthcare facility, remember that we will be getting aspect cases, we'll even be getting cases coming to our doors. We don't want a temperature missed at the gate to end up in a consultation room having mingled with other clients in the waiting area. It is important that facilities have a screening tool and a screening test. Teresia, we are losing you. Okay. Talk to you, Mike. Yes, I, am. I think the network is just passing. I am saying that the facilities need to create a screening tool and be able to screen well, following the test definition. Thank you. Thank you, Teresia. Thank you so much. Uh, how long can the virus stay without the host? The host here being the different uh, materials that we mentioned previously, metal, wood, plastic, cloth, hair, hand, uh, vehicles, right. How long can the virus stay? Dr. Elizabeth? Um, so the virus can, depending on whatever material that you have, the virus can stay active in various materials for long. I think the, the longest should be aluminum where it stays for about 48 hours. In surgical gloves, you'd have anything between six and eight hours. Um, so, in terms of, it will depend with whatever material that that is that is happening, uh, that is being that is being held. But the recommendation by WHO is to continuously disinfect surfaces using using jig and water, so that you avoid the risk of having the surfaces contaminate someone else. But the 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 duration would vary based on whatever material is there, and this is ongoing ongoing research that is going on as you continue learning about COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allow me to ask two more questions here about transmission. The first one is between a nursing mother who is breastfeeding. So can the mother uh, through breastfeeding uh, infect the, the baby? And also do, can mosquitoes and ticks and all these other insects in the house uh, spread the virus? There is no clear there's no clear evidence of um, co coronavirus being found in breast milk. However, because of of course the the close contact between mother and baby, they might get infected through, through other modalities that uh, through the eyes, through the mouth, and through the nose, but not necessarily from the breast milk. I think and Walter the... was talking. I agree with you. Um, in terms of transmission, we don't have yet that uh, research report telling us, but it is prudent that, that because of the social distance, the closeness of the baby, still droplets could be a cause of transmission, but not necessarily through breast milk. We have no uh, information about that yet. So in the same very case, somebody is asking about the milk. So if somebody who is COVID positive milking the cow, so there's no possibility of the virus getting access through the milk to the market. Wow, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. uh, however, I don't think 
I don't think based on the IPC procedures that undergoes bilk, whether it's pasteurization, I assume pasteurization is meant to kill all organisms. And that is why possibly uh, we boil milk or if it's not boiled, usually we get it from from uh, processes when it has already been pasteurized. So all the IPC processes that come with food production have to be put in place. Okay, so in that case, we are also saying that mosquito is not a very good vector for COVID uh, transmission because it is a respiratory uh, disease. So mosquito is not one of the, 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 the means of uh, spreading COVID, right? Yes. That's very that's true. Thank you. Uh, an another question again, most of the questions are basically related. Uh, somebody here is asking that uh, like Ebola, okay, that is about pest. Can Ebola, like, like Ebola, can COVID if, uh, uh, infect animals or pests? if the owner is positive. The issue of cats and dogs getting COVID because the owner was tested positive. Can the cats uh, and dogs also spread COVID? So pretty much I think uh, COVID, as you know, I think we've only been here for four months knowing how COVID-19 responds. There have been claims in the US where some, some animals were actu actually tested COVID positive, but of course it's, we, are still, we are all still learning and uh, possibly research will come up and we'll know whether it's actually human to other, other, other animal transmission. Yes, uh, hello, Ken. Yes, yes, please. Yes, I, I, I think I agree with it, uh, Dr. Elizabeth. You know, this being a novel virus, a lot more research needs to be done for us to really understand how it has been, maybe it's genome and all that. Is it able to affect uh, other animals? Uh, as such, so that now we can really be able to understand more, of, more about it. So as she has said, uh, we really need to do more research yeah? and really so that we can be able to understand about uh, the virus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and still on the same, uh, what happens if a sample is transported in a non-cooler box medium? Um, okay, maybe, maybe I can take that. Uh -huh. uh, there has been, there, there, you, you know, we, we are talking about uh, transporting the sample as soon as possible after we've corrected and we transport between uh, at four degrees. Eh? Uh, actually, it can take between two to eight. Now, if you are not using a Cura box, then you have to make sure that you maintain a cold chain system. Very important, cold chain system, because uh, we, may, we may end up now losing it. It can be a little bit weak, and we may end up losing it. And we want to obtain as much as it was taken from the, uh, from the patient. So it's a good question, but uh, following the IPC guidelines is important, but uh, cold chain is important. Thank you. So in that case, you're saying, I'm also linking it to another question here. If somebody who had COVID and touched a packet of milk in a shop and you go get the same packet and put it in a refrigerator, so that means that in your refrigerator, the COVID virus will still be available in your fridge because of the temperatures there. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, because of, uh, the, 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 I don't think that after you get a packet of milk and you got it from the shop, if you did not follow the directives, and the directives are you clean your heart and uh, uh, just the other day, we are also having a lot of discussion that even, even if you go to the market and you buy fruits and everything or whatever from the shop, you come and clean them. This is just in case somebody had touched, they have the virus. Again, the virus could still be there. But if you followed those rules and then you place your milk in the refrigerator, then I don't think the virus will be there. But if you've just gotten it, uh, your hearts were soiled with the virus, then you, you kept it there. Well, maybe we need to get more research done, but, I, but uh, my, my, my first uh, thought would be we could still have the virus there. But again, now the timing is what we need to really understand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, an open question to all the panelists. Again, on the virus, uh, Samuel Otieno is asking, that uh, like most viruses, for example, HIV, when they enter human body, they replicate and multiply. 
and he's wondering how comes the coronavirus, instead of multiplying, it sheds off after 14 to 21 days. What is wrong with it? <laughs> I think all viruses pretty much <laughs> would multiply in the body and, uh, and attack cells. And uh, you still have viral shedding. That is why, you, mm. that is why you'd, you'd have the infection go away because your body is fighting it. So yes, all viruses, maybe you don't speak about shedding a lot in, in other infections, but it still happens. Okay, so in the interest of time, we only had uh, two hours, so we'll add a, a little bit of 15 minutes so that we take exactly the amount of hours we promised our participants. So we'll take uh, two more questions and then we'll take a round of uh, uh, comments from our plenary and then we shall close it from there. So somebody, Rotich Zakayo, is asking, can COVID fail to be detected in the first incubation days? and turn out later to be positive. Right, like for example, we are now repatriating our guys from China, London, uh, and different countries. Yeah. Maybe by the time they're leaving those countries, their incubation days are not yet uh, detected. And now when they're in the country, then they turn positive. Is that possible? I think it is, it is possible that you'll get a negative test if you had contact with a person maybe the first two, three days of, of you having contact. And that is why when you notice MOH is actually testing past day five. So most of the people who come into the country will get their, te their test past day five. So because by then we expect, uh, we most likely expect that you'll, you'll turn positive if truly you've, you have actually gotten the infection. So, and also, again, also depends on the method of sample collection as has been, has been explained by our lab scientists. Thank you. And then uh, two more questions. Why is the virus seems to be attacking only more men than female uh, across the, the globe, even the case of Kenya? Why is COVID-19 affecting more men across the globe and even the case for Kenya? Is there something that men don't do right? <laughs> Maybe this, this may be explained in future based on the data that would have been collected by the end of the pandemic or even as the pandemic grows. Because um, it's not a cause and effect thing. It's not because you're a man that you're getting COVID. It might be because of other either comorbidities. So this, has, this will have to be also checked through various data analysis. It could be because maybe they are more outside compared to women. It could be because of genetic issues. So pretty much this, this might be explained when you have maybe like big data being analyzed and possibly it can give a bit of reason why, why you have such a picture. Thank you. I also want to add that uh, in terms of uh, men affecting, affected more than women, uh, I think uh, more analysis is needed. For example, um, social determinants. If you look at tuberculosis, it's affecting more men than women. And if you look at the reason, they are also there. So let's wait and see when we do proper analysis and even triangulation and really looking at even bivariate and multivariate analysis. So we need a lot of analysis to be able to really relate and say that this is because of this reason. For now, let, let, let's just say that maybe it is something that is not within our domain of knowledge now. Okay, so I will ask one more question and then we take a round of uh, uh, last comments. Dorcas Mutua is asking, infrared thermometers are wrongly handled or used especially in the supermarkets by security personnel and they are pointing uh, the infrared right in the eyes of the community. Is there a way that they can be ed uh, educated on how to handle the infrared thermometers? Of course, um, I think in the, in the health sector, that would be, that would be our, our obligation and duty um, to possibly show people who have just been thrown into a role that they have never done before. So for sure, for sure, this is something probably KHF and also medical associations can take up and, and uh, give maybe information on how do you use a, how do you best use that thermometer. Okay, and finally, finally, I have Evans Sumba and Linus Sodiambo. Let me start with Linus. Linus is asking, 
that according to the case definition that all feeds presenting with pneumonia must be tested for COVID, could the caregivers be considered for the same test as well? That is from Linus, according to the case definition that all feeds are presenting with pneumonia must be tested for COVID. Will the caregivers also be considered for the same tests? And then from Evans, I have been having this persistent sore throat while tingling and slight, discom and slight discomfort forcing me to clear my throat regularly with slight headache. Is this something to worry about? So let's start with Linus and then we go to Evans. Can I take that? Yes. So in sure. terms of testing, in terms of testing, of course, in a pandemic, you would want to test everybody. So when a child is presenting with a lower respiratory tract infection, and uh, you, for all of them, the case definition is anybody, depending whatever age you are, you get a COVID test if you have a pneumonia. So yes, you'll test the child. And if the child turns positive, then you'll go ahead and now test the caregiver. But you wouldn't go ahead and test both of them in the interest of the fact that you don't have enough kids. You want to test the, you want to do targeted testing, and the targeted testing is a patient. Suppose now that the patient, the child, were to turn positive, that is when now you do contact tracing and test everybody. But in an ideal situation where we have unlimited funding, of course, we'd want to test everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, there's, a one, there's one more interesting here, which I, I will not want to ignore it. Uh, but let's go first to the Lina's question. Yes, Walter, are you there for the Lina's question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, then Lina's to one, you know, when we start worrying of what we are feeling, then it becomes risky at the same time. I would request that the course for checkup, eh? Remember when as a medic, because I hope he's a medical person here, um, we don't treat ourselves. Get someone to assist you also now get assessed so that you don't treat ourselves. Otherwise, we will actually do up, uh, some, some worries and then you can over treat ourselves. The only important thing is if he, uh, in terms of exposure, the question should go back. Does he or she feel that they, he has exposed himself? Then if that is the case, is it that because he has maybe a previous sore throat or an infection, or is this somebody who has even, for example, asthma? So it's good that he gets assessed independently so that we rule out that there would be any form of uh, maybe COVID so that you go test yourself. But being a health worker, and we are looking at testing all the health workers, then you could benefit from the test just to be sure that there's something or there's nothing. So it's good that uh, maybe as we roll out the testing to health workers, then he can benefit. But for now, let him go to be assessed by an independent practitioner. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, we have uh, come to the close. We have three minutes. So our panelists, kindly take us through your parting shots to all our participants. Uh, we had a very good turnout today of 770 participants, and thank you once again for tuning in. So let's start with uh, Steve, and then we go to Teresia, then Dr. Liz, then Walter, then we close. Uh, Steve, you are parting short to the participants. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, it's, uh, it has been a very good uh, day very good labor day when we are doing this presentation and we really appreciate all the participants who managed to join us uh i know there is quite a lot of questions that are coming in with the testing mass testing is now the talk in town and uh, there has been also a lot of uh, issues like on serology the testing and uh, one thing i would tell everyone is that uh, more information we are gathering more information a lot of research is being done the virus has been with us for a short time, so a lot more information needs to be gathered before we get more serology tests out for the antibody testing, because I know I've been asked several questions about that. But currently, it is a PCR which is being done across, and we have several facilities across the country which are undertaking. I know in the video, somebody has commented that um, the fear of uh, the samples being taken. I would urge everyone that uh, gather more information. Uh, it is important that uh, you are tested when that time comes and uh, you don't have to fear. 
because that would be the first way of us uh, being to defeat this uh, pandemic. All in all, I want to wish everybody a good month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Teresia? Thank you, Ken. Um, I would like to tell the participants that um, we really need to prepare ourselves for the facilities that can be able to um, screen patients well and be able to guide them in the next step so that they are handled in the best way possible to avoid um, transmission even in our health facilities. We need to deploy full measures of infection prevention and control. This will be the use of and hygiene, hand rub, and, uh, and having even a respiratory uh, etiquette in the facility. And we need to handle contacts well so that they can be able to give us more information so that we don't miss out um, contact in the facilities in the community. We need to be able to stop the spread and uh, bring the disease to a controllable level. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Walter? Uh, Ken, uh, thank you very much. Um, mine will be brief. It's to appreciate the participants and everyone who has made this happen. Thank you very much. Um, we are doing very well. We've had a series of these webinars from the 17th of April, uh, and now we are coming towards the end of the six series webinars which we have our last one next uh, Thursday. However, we have series every Tuesday. Um, last week we had one on Swiss model, Swiss cheese model, and we have also the same coming up next Tuesday, same time. So I look forward to everyone participating. And um, what I would say is, let us continue and expect more of regular updates on COVID and other also important priorities in health in the coming days. So let's partner together and participate to be empowered frontline workers and we will win this war. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth. Um, my niece to say that I'm very grateful um, that I learned a lot today. Um, Walter and Stephen Mundene were quite informative in their presentation and I'm sure the participants today um, we'll be very happy going forward to learning about how we collect samples, transportation, and even how we're analyzed. So even as we go ahead, is to continue pushing government to continue with mass, mass targeted testing um, so that you're able to fight this war. Thank you so much. Dr. Rui, you came when we had already started. Can't we just introduce yourself to the participants so they know uh, you okay, also? So, <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Dr. Elizabeth Kitao Maina. I'm the CEO of Kenya Medical Association, uh, and KMA is a member of KHF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chari. And for Lil, uh, Lea, um, Lea Omega, Lea Omega is asking if we can add nutritionists to these uh, discussions, yes. Um, and all our frontline workers out there, if you want to be a part and parcel of this presentation, just write to us and uh, through COVID-19 at khf.co.ke, put your request and we shall be able to add you as our panelists uh, because we have three sessions per week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, same time from two to four, right? So mine is to thank you so very much for, for, for coming uh, in large numbers and the country needs us in as much as we are looking for solution on behalf of uh, the country Kenya. We are helping where we are coming from. If we don't do this, then we shall not have a country called Kenya. So thank you very much and may God bless you and wish you a fruitful weekend and hope you have a happy Labor Day. As we are being told, sanitize, wash your hands, stay safe, stay in those, only go out if necessary. And may God bless you all. See you again next week on Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. And thank you, panelists, for the good job. And Leah, we thank you. We thank you so much for the support. I know it was a holiday, but again, COVID and a holiday, our journey, right? So thank you very much, and see you again next time.